Today we're talking about molecular dynamics. So let's start with what is molecular dynamics. It's quite easy, let's do it simple. We have a box with inside a certain number of atoms or molecules if you like. And we simply apply Newton's law. So F equal mass acceleration to each single particle. Uh, so, we all we calculate the forces by the interactions with each other particle we have, so this with this, this with this, 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 and then every other particle. We calculate the forces and then apply force equal m times acceleration. So what we get will be the acceleration well, equal to force divided mass. And then once we have the acceleration, we can find the velocity and the position the next step. That's it. We could almost end the video here. But then, let's be a bit more specific. What we're doing is integrating the equations of motion of the system step by step. So in general, we will of course have an energy that will be a kinetic plus a potential part. The kinetic part depends on the velocities that we already calculated before and the potential part is usually only dependent on the interaction between each single atom. So let's consider that we are using a Lennard-Jones. We simply need to know the analytical expression for the force derived from a Lennard-Jones and we will be able to calculate F on each single particle so, yes, what we did is transform a more complex potential in a pairwise potential, thus we will have pairwise forces, and then by adding them up for each atom, we will have the total force. So, the fact that we are studying the system that explores the phase space in a completely free way, simply by respecting Newton's law, so classical mechanics, there are some cases in which there is ab initio or quantum molecular dynamics, but they are very specific techniques. Usually we will use classical mechanics. So by letting the system explore the phase space freely and uh, evolve freely, what we do is actually doing a computer experiment because we set up the experiment, so some kind of initial conditions. We let the system equilibrate because usually your initial condition will be something very easy to do, but uh, not the equilibrium distribution. Often you won't really know the equilibrium distribution. For example, if you want to do a liquid, you could start by with a simple crystal structure like a cubic one of each mo molecule or atom or whatever, and then let it melt. Of course, you need to start with a high enough temperature to let the melting happen. Otherwise, of course, your structure will remain in a metal stable situation. So, now the once that you have melted this crystal, you will let the system evolve in time at a certain moment you will arrive at equilibrium. Of course, you, it's not so easy to understand immediately if you are or if you are not at equilibrium, you will have to measure it or st estimate it. Exactly as in a normal experiment, you can't know a priori. You have to see if the temperature is constant for a certain amount of time or whatever your normal laboratory experiment asks you to do. Then, once you have your system at the equilibrium, at the temperature, pressure, whatever you're interested in, and you're sure that it's behaving as you want, then you start measuring whatever you're interested in. So, for example, temperature or pressure or energy. It, it really depends. And at uh, that point, well, you will start me measuring it. But exactly as inside a normal experiment, there will be statistical noise. And the only way to reduce the statistical noise is to measure for longer times. But exactly as in a normal experiment, you can stay there for 2 million years looking at the temperature in order to be sure you completely destroyed the, or that you completely eliminated the statistical noise. So you will have some kind of statistical error in, on your measurement, exactly as in a normal experiment. And exactly as in a normal experiment, 
if you set your initial conditions wrong or you measure the wrong thing, you will get wrong results. But if you do everything right, you should get good results as long, of course, as the, as the force field you're using is in complete trash. Now try to look at a little bit better on. If you only implement it, as I said, of course you will be exploring the microcanonical ensemble, so constant particles, volume and energy. So temperature will fluctuate. That's the standard. You have a closed box. If particles bounce against the box, they will bounce back. Because it's literally some particles inside a very big box that are interacting together. But what can we do if we are interested in, for example, sampling different ensembles, like the canonical ensemble that we all know is with constant temperature? Okay, then at this point, the energy won't be constant anymore because we will have to introduce a thermostat. There are different kinds of thermostats. There are deterministic, stochastic ones, like some famous ones can be the Andersen thermostat for a stochastic thermostat or the Nussi-Hover or the Nussi-Hover chains for the deterministic thermostat. But we'll talk about them in another video. Or... What can we do if we are interested in exploring uh, the behavior of a bulk? Okay, then in that case, instead of having closed boundaries, we can have the boundaries very similar to the old snake video game. So we will have periodic boundary conditions. So if we go out here, we will get in here. In this way, we will get a bulk-like system. Even though it's actually a periodic system, if we do it big enough, we can hope not to get the spurious results. So how could we do a very naive, very very simple molecular dynamic program? Let's do something incredibly simple and naive with only atoms like a gas or a liquid is not too important. So, as you can see, that's the more or less the structure of uh, the un standard molecular dynamic program. So, we will initiate the system somehow. As said, for example, if you want to study a gas or a liquid, um, in order to avoid to having so overimposed atoms and thus energies that go to infinity, you we will have to find some smart way to do it. And for example, it may be that we simply put everything on a crystal or in a very very easy lattice. As said, you must give enough initial ener energy, so kinetic energy, thus velocity, in order to destroy it quite quickly. Otherwise, you will find yourself in a metal stable system. Thus, while you initiate, you will also have to give some random velocities. Quite often, uh, the random velocities in the beginning are chosen in a way that we will have a total linear momentum equal to zero. That's because some methods work better and are able actually to conserve the total linear momentum if it is zero, but they don't work so good or they're not able to conserve total linear momentum if it's not zero. So it's quite common, not, a, not compulsory. So we will give some initial call situations. Then we will calculate the forces, as said before. For example, with Eleanor Jones, we will start calculating the forces depending on the potential energy. And that's the most time-consuming part of the program. In fact, it's incredibly slow because you have to go scaling for it, checking for each single atom with each single atom. So if we are not using some tricks to make it quicker, because they do exist, it scales as an O of n square. With some tricks you can go to an O of n, where n is the number of atoms.
but without tricks it's incredibly incredibly slow and that's where most parts of the molecular dynamic program will spend its computing time then once you have the forces you will solve the equations of motion thus finding out the position and usually also the velocities in order to know the kinetic energy and to be sure we are conserving energy if we are supposed to and then we will have to calculate whatever we're interested in so temperature pressure energy uh, correlation functions radial distributions whatever you're interested in you calculate it for that step and then you recalculate the forces again remove the particles again and calculate whatever you want and again and again and again in a loop till the end of the program when you then exit and close the program now in the next video we will see actually how we are going to uh, select an algorithm to integrate equations of motion and a very famous algorithm that is called the velocity Berlin. I hope you enjoyed the video all the sources and the materials I used to do it are written in the description below. And here is some more content for you. But wait, don't click on it yet. First remember to leave a feedback in the comments section to let me know what you think about it. Like, subscribe, follow me on social media, links in the description. And if you would like to support the channel, consider to donate on Patreon. Again, link in the description below. See you next time. I'm Maurice Karnbrock for The Computational Chemist.